Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ETI's 2022 annual customer event. I am Sabrina Porter, Director of Customer Experience, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. For the next two hours, you're going to meet some of our product experts for the next and learn more, learn about the initiatives ETI has been investing in. We're very excited to share the major developments to our flagship product triad. We continue to add functionality to our service management platform, SMP. ETI's SMP product is the only communication service provider solution for the Microsoft Power Platform. And we have two special guest speakers, our customers, All Points Broadband and Service Electric Cable Vision. A detailed agenda can be found in the handout section of your webinar dashboard. We will divide the sessions into two parts. First, the first hour will focus on triad updates, video strategies, and roadmap. The second hour will concentrate on our service management platform developed with Microsoft as well as Microsoft's Business Central. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Please ask questions throughout the day in the questions area of the control panel. We will answer any questions as we can, as many as we can during the session. And for the questions that we don't get to, we will follow up with an answer by email. Lastly, there will be a short survey sent to you by email. We appreciate your feedback. I hope you enjoy our presentations. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, ETI's Vice President of Pre-Sales, Chris Beisner. Chris, take it away. Hello. I can hear you. Yeah, I've got some, sorry, something's jammed on my computer here. Um, all right. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> hey everybody, Chris Weisner here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm excited to talk to you today about <clears throat> the latest release of Triad. Triad 6. Now, Triad 6 represents many months of ETI engineering effort, culminating in a major revision of our best in class OSS application. As you'll soon learn, Triad 6 contains a host of new features on top of several significant infrastructure changes, which will serve to carry Triad customers and ETI well into the future. Let me begin with a brief glimpse into some of the major changes newly introduced with Triad 6. I'm happy to report that with this release, Triad has been fully containerized. There are several benefits for having done so, but for now, I want to focus on the fact that Triad can now be deployed anywhere, including in the cloud. This means it can be loaded into Azure, Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud. It can still be run locally or in a data center. The choice is yours. Triad as an application with the help of Kubernetes, a specialized container orchestration software is now self-monitoring and self-healing. This means that if the container running a part of the application runs into a problem, that container can be rebuilt before the problem further impacts the use of Triad, all without system admin intervention. In addition, Kubernetes is also responsible for optimizing resource utilization. As such, it will move containers around as necessary to get the most out of each node in the cluster. With Triad 6, ETI has added an entirely new data visualization and analytics capability. This is split into two parts, one for system monitoring and one for logging. And finally, Triad is ready now for the challenges of tomorrow. 
We've achieved this in several ways, but I'm most excited to talk to you today about our new paradigm for building controllers. More on this in a minute. As you'll soon see, and I hope that you agree, there are lots of advantages to moving to Triad 6. Some that are worth calling out. Freedom to deploy anywhere, including the cloud, significantly improved security, better utilization of server resources, easy to understand visual representations of system metrics and performance, and proactive alarming and alerting. And finally, more system uptime. As I go through the rest of the presentation, I'll try to call out the new features and functions to which these benefits are linked. Speaking of new features, let's take a look at some of the more significant additions with Triad 6. As with any release, there are several new controllers that we're happy to now have in Triad's inventory. <clears throat> what is equally exciting is how these controllers were built. Our integration paradigm has several benefits not the least of which is being able to deliver and modify controllers without having to install triad patches or version updates. While not technically a feature of the application itself, the new recommended deployment model brings with it for the first time high availability and fault tolerance, and as always, data replication. With triad six, we have a new, more secure method for authenticating and authorizing users, We've added a whole new layer of active performance monitoring, coupled with easy to digest instrument visualizations, alarming and alerting. There's a new logging system that makes locating and parsing log entries that much easier. And tying it all together is a comprehensive web-based user portal, which greatly simplifies access to Triad and all its corresponding pieces and extensions. Let's spend some time now and go through each of these features in more detail. Starting off the list of new controllers are Positron Access and Ready Links. Both of these interfaces are enable provisioning control over customer facing ports on G.HN network gear. G.HN has eclipsed G.Fast as the prevalent solution for MDUs and large buildings. If you're not familiar with this technology, I encourage you to give it a look, especially if you're in need of an affordable and easy to deploy solution for delivering high speed data services to MDUs and other large buildings constrained by the limits of legacy copper wiring. The Plume controller automates the onboarding of subscribers to the Plume service for managed Wi-Fi. Following my presentation, we have a interview that was recorded yesterday with Scott Young of Service Electric Cable Vision where Scott will talk about SCCV's use of Plume um, in addition to using TiVo as their new IPTV solution. <clears throat> the free radius controller can be used in support of a third party implementation of free radius or with ETI's newly available full implementation of the free radius suite. I'll be talking about that more in a minute. The other two controllers on this list, Allianz and C-Change, are effectively rewrites of older integrations using the latest vendor supply API. These new APIs are much more secure than the older APIs that they replaced. As an extension, so too are the new tried controllers for both Allianz and C-Change. And it's for this reason that I would encourage anybody who's using either of these to look at moving to the latest gen of those controllers. <clears throat> While not complete, it's worth mentioning that we're building integrations right now to Adtran Mosaic Cloud and Nokia Altiplano. These are on par with Calix SMX and are used in support of the latest SDN compliant network equipment from the big three. Once finished, these controllers will be the latest in a long line of fiber controllers that we'll, we'll have in the tried inventory. While we're on the topic of controllers, I want to call out three important tried extensions. The first is Free Radius. Not to be confused with the Free Radius controller, this is the actual implementation of the full Free Radius suite, including the Radius server. 
radius servers are typically used for authentication and authorization and authorization of broadband network users. We can stand this up within the triad environment or we can put it in a separate environment. Um, it would really come down to the size and you know the decisions around that, but we can work with you to come up with the right plan. What's exciting about this is that it speaks to the kind of things that ETI has done and will continue to do to its product portfolio in the months and years to come. A little later in today's agenda, you'll be hearing from my good friend and colleague, David Tidd, as he talks about the Triad Roadmap and some of the exciting stuff that he's got in the works. The next two items on the list, OBAPI and BLS, are new, or not new with Triad 6, but are worth reviewing as they both play a pivotal role in our integration paradigm. The OBAPI controller is Triad's webhook for notifying external applications when something has changed within Triad's database. Examples would include things like ads, changes, or deletes of subscriber record, records, device records, or phone records. Triad supports multiple concurrent running instances of OBAPI, each with its own unique orientation and configuration. OBAPI can be thought of as a highly configurable controller that can be tuned to meet the needs of some specific endpoint. The business logic service is an ETI built controller fabrication and runtime environment that is external to Triad. It allows for the rapid creation of provisioning configuration files using a no-code, low-code approach that handles the communications with third-party APIs. There are numerous tools and advantages of using BLS for building integrations and running them once built. It's fast, efficient, and easy to maintain. For these reasons, ETI has shifted all controller development to using a combination of OBAPI and BLS, just like you see in the diagram here. Our new method for writing controllers makes use of these two components, <clears throat> where the REST commands generated by OBAPI are received by BLS and then converted into the appropriate commands for whatever the endpoint is that it's talking to on the other end. ETI engineering has been using OBAPI and BLS the last couple of years to write controllers. All the controllers I listed a couple slides back were written this way. One significant approach that I mentioned a minute ago about doing this is that we can now deliver controllers to customers without having to first install a new triad version or to update existing controllers without having to deliver a patch. We simply need to provide a new version of the controller's pipeline config file since BLS is completely external to Triad, the version of the pipeline config file, or DAW, is not tied to the Triad version. In time, we'll be doing more to grant customers with direct access to BLS, the purpose of which will be to empower you to write and or maintain your own integrations if you choose to do so. We have a couple of customers right now who are conducting beta trials of the tools as a product. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, one of the big changes that we made to Triad was to break it into smaller pieces, referred to as microservices, and put them inside containers. A good example of that would be the controllers that we were just talking about. We can deliver controllers now as microservices within a container. By putting Triad into containers, we can now deploy it anywhere. Better still, containers can be moved around as necessary to take full advantage of available resources. Managing all of this, <clears throat> the, the container builds and the assignments, is a special bit of orchestration software called Kubernetes. Think of Kubernetes as the brains. Not only can it create containers and deploy them, it monitors the containers while they're running, and it will take action if necessary. If, for example, a container crashes or is showing signs of being overloaded, Kubernetes will instantiate a new container, either, either replace the one that has failed or take some of the load off of an existing container. Coupled with our new deployment model, this makes Triad 6 the first highly available and fault-tolerant solution in, in ETI's history. 
It also provides a mechanism for real-time data replication. The diagram on this slide shows ETI's recommended production deployment configuration. Made possible through the use of containers and Kubernetes, this architecture calls for five nodes arranged in a 3-2 configuration, with three nodes running the app and two supporting the database. In this config, work can be distributed as necessary among the three application nodes, and as already mentioned, through the use of Kubernetes. New containers will be created on the fly in the event of a problem, and the app will continue to run even if an entire node fails. In this particular arrangement, with three nodes running the app, any one of those three can fail, and try will continue to run. For, so that gives you one, one fault. For larger systems, you can add additional nodes in pairs. You would always have an odd number for additional faults. So if you wanted to have a two-fault resilient system, you would need five nodes. If you wanted a three, fault tolerant system, you would need to have seven. On the database side, there are two supporting nodes, one for the primary database and one for the secondary. As changes are written to the primary database, they're also recorded in the secondary. In doing so, any possibility of data loss is more or less eliminated should the primary fail, as the secondary will have an exact replica of the data from, from the production primary box. For non-production systems like TEST, a, a two-node configuration will generally suffice where you've got one application node and one DB node. This comes with the understanding that there is no fault tolerance and there's no data replication. It's for this reason that we don't recommend the two-node configuration for production. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the other features that are new with Triad 6. First up is our shift to key cloak for Triad user authentication and authorization. Keycloak is an open source identity access management tool. What this means is that Triad user credentials and permissions are no longer managed within Triad. Instead, we do that through Keycloak. Keycloak offers many advantages, including support for single sign-on, single sign-off, two-factor authentication, LDAP and Active Directory support, and password policy management. Coming back to the topic of security, once a user has been authenticated by Keycloak, they're issued a temporary token. This token is shared with Triad. Any requests made by the user during their, their Triad session that do not have the correct token or have no token at all will be rejected out of hand. This is just one example of how we've improved Triad's overall security. I'm really excited to tell you about these next two features, system monitoring with visualization and instrumentation and proactive alerting. To the first item, we've added dozens of monitors to Triad, all with the same basic goal in mind, to provide insight as to the performance health of the environment, the application, and the operation. Each of these monitors is paired with a visual instrument to facilitate rapid understanding of the state of a metric or indicator. As this slide shows, we have an example of an environment monitor with insight as to the state of Kubernetes, both present and past. The inclusion of time series graphs and charts is pervasive. This is extremely helpful when researching or troubleshooting issues as the graphs make it easy to spot when a problem started or stopped. The next slide shows an example of an application monitor with visibility into controllers and controller queues. Down the road, system admins will be able to see queue counts from a historical perspective and drill into the details of transactions that may have failed, encountered an error, or simply timed out. What's really cool is the ability to set up alarms and alerts from the various monitors that we've added to Triad. Rather than having to periodically check monitors to make sure that everything is operating in the green. You'll be able to configure the system to send an email or text if something goes off the rails, like when an active controller gets stuck. As triad system admins, you'll have control over the threshold values, 
the type of alert, and the frequency with which the alert is sent, all of which will be captured in Triad's new logging system. The new logging system, which consists of Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana, has a powerful search feature coupled with an easy to use user interface, making it much easier and faster to locate and isolate log entries than ever before. The new logging system is also responsible for recording various system and environment updates, providing a more detailed view of the overall Triad installation. The final slide shows the new Triad admin portal with a quick launch icons in the different parts of the application and the supporting components. Now, as long as my system is behaving, I'd like to show that to you in real time now, um, but I may have a user problem here. Give me one second. Okay. Oh, why are you doing this? It's frozen. Why is it frozen? Uh, hang on a second. Looks like I'm having some system problems. Um, what we're going to need to do is uh, move ahead with the agenda. Um, I'll try to get this repaired. And if we have some time at the end, we can come back and I will show you the, the real time view of some of the features that I was just talking about. So <clears throat> up next, we have an interview that was recorded yesterday uh, with Scott Young, Director of Marketing and Project Management for Service Electric Cable Vision. Um, where he's talking about some of the current challenges that they've had with regard to, you know, coming up with a new solution for video and for in managing in-home Wi-Fi. So with that, um, why don't we go ahead and get that video kicked off? Thank you for joining us today. I have uh, with us a special guest, Scott Young. He's the Director of Marketing and Project Management at SECV. Hey, Scott, thanks for uh, participating today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, today we're going to spend some time digging into um, how you guys at uh, SECV, um, the challenges that you've seen recently, what you're going to see around the road, and just really help uh, us understand what you've taken away, some of the valuable lessons learned. Um, but before we do that, if you can just help us a little quick background on who SECV is. Sure. Um, you know, SECV is our acronym for Service Electric Cable Vision. Mm -hmm. So um, we were founded in 1948. So, you know, known as the, the very first cable operator. Um, and we're based in Pennsylvania. Um, originally, Monoy City is where the, uh, the first office was. Um, we actually are split from the original Service Electric as the companies um, in the early 90s. Um, became their own entities. So um, we, we still operate in the eastern part of PA, up in some of the, the northern regions. So part of the Philadelphia market, as well as the uh, Wilkes-Barre DMA. Um, we service residential customers, business customers. Um, at this point, we have um, a little over 100,000 subscribers in 100 communities. So um, our, our product offerings range from, uh, we just launched our 1.5 gig downstream product um, earlier this spring. Uh, supported by our, our Plume Home, home Wi-Fi. Um, we're full IPTV, um, powered by TiVo, um, and, and most of the other um, features uh, that come with all those products. So um, we've, we've scaled pretty well over the last few years. Um, yeah, so. No, it's helpful. An overview, yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. And uh, maybe just a little bit about how you ended up in this role with SEC. Absolutely. So um, I started my career um, as a, as an, actually an IT consultant, um, but my undergrad was in marketing. So I've always had that marketing background, became an IT project manager, um, with computer sciences corporation. Um, I bounced over to the, to the, uh, wireless world with Nextel, where I did a lot of product management and project management, 
Um, and then over the years, kind of worked my way into the, uh, you know, the cable TV internet space um, in the back in uh, 2010, so about 12 years now. So came over here, um, used both that background in IT as well as, as marketing, and, and I use that in my role even today. You know, with, with mid-sized company, we kind of all wear multiple hats. So I'm always bouncing around between uh, marketing, product management, project management. So it keeps my plate full for sure. Yeah, people forget how versatile us marketing folks are, you know, <laughs> so right. it's good to see. Um, you know, we've been working with, uh, ETI has been working with you all for some time and we've helped you through a couple of different challenges. Specifically, I want to talk about um, the, what you guys saw is some of your evolution and challenges around video technologies and services. Um, so what is it that you guys were facing and how would you characterize those? Um, so, yeah, we originally, you know, it, it, for us on the TV side, we, we sort of knew what our roadmap was. We wanted to be, you know, we wanted an IPTV solution. We looked at, you know, at, our, at the future of TV and, you know, quant based system, um, you know, is, I'm not going to say that it's going away. I mean, it's, it's quite a few years away. We still have a lot of customers that are still on ETAs, et cetera. But, you know, we wanted, um, you know, a, a solution that could get us, you know, that full um, unified experience, you know, full, at, at, at that point, it was, you know, whole home DVR, um, getting into the mobile apps, things like that. So we, we looked at multiple vendors for that. Originally, we started with um, a legacy vendor, which we, for a couple of years, but then we sort of knew that we needed to, to be um, working with TiVo. Um, we, we liked where they were going. We thought, you know, with getting us to the IP solution, um, just the features of, of that product. So we started out with you know, their MG2 product, um, which was at that time for a, you know, as, as, as hardware was, was sort of top of the line from a TiVo solution. So they were just rolling out their, their Gen 6 um, uh, UI. So, you know, we, we made that jump from our, our legacy whole home DVR to, to the TiVo DVR with, you know, with uh, ETI's help as well with that um, integrating into our, our billing system. So um, from there though, you know, as I mentioned, our, our, we wanted a, a, a full IP solution. So uh, about two years ago, and, and it certainly took longer than that to get there. So standing up an IPTV system in conjunction to a QAM system certainly takes a lot of work. Um, you know, but we knew from a hardware perspective, it would help us reduce costs. So, so CP equipment would go down. Um, we partnered with Evolution on that with their eStreamer, which is, is a box that, you know, we, we think is, is, you know, is the future for us. And it has been. Um, it, it allows us to have, you know, with our, we're calling we actually branded it as TiVo Stream. Um, it has full IP, uh, all our channels are IP. Um, it, the App Store allows, is powered by Google. So any app that's available, you are, you know, when you when you log in with Google, it's available to our customers on, on that box, which we, you know, not having to change inputs, all, all of those factors were, were important in selecting the hardware as well as the vendor. So um, they're, they're, it's just so feature rich where even the UI itself is, you know, it learned about the customer. And TiVo's always been that way, I think from day one when they came out, but um, even more so today with, with the recommendations, predictions, and, and it crosses everything from live TV to on demand to the OTT apps. So, um, you know, we knew for us to stay competitive in this market that we needed a solution like that. So, um, you know, we're, we're happy with where it is, but we're also taking it other places. Um, you know, we're, look, we're, we're in the process of building out our bring your own device solution. So building to the customer's hardware. So once again, trying to reduce some of those costs for hardware and CPU equipment, um, you know, that, that will allow us to, you know, put that full app on Apple TV, um, you know, other streaming devices like Fire Stick. So, so in the early phases of that and, and trying to figure out if that's a solution our customers want, um, which is half the battle sometimes, but um, you know, we, we're, we're marching towards that right now, which is on our roadmap. So, so we're still, still further to go there, but, um, you know, as we build out, we're, we're starting to build out fiber of the home in areas in greenfield areas, as well as brownfield areas. And this is the solution we're putting in those homes. So, you know, you, it has to be an IP solution. So, you know, this either between the evolution e streamer box, as well as the bring, bring your own device, we think we have kind of a flavor for, for, for all our TV customers and potential TV customers. Yeah, no, thanks for reviewing all that. And it sounds like it's been a, a multi-year, multi-technology approach. Um, you know, what are some of the lessons learned that, that jump out that, that some of our listeners can benefit from? Um, sure. I mean, as I mentioned, this, this is not something you stand up in a few months. This is, you know, everyone has to be pulling in the, right, in the same direction. And, and for the first time for us is, you know, when you're QAM-based and, and you have your own head end and, 
you know, our, if we have an issue with a channel, our engineers fix it or our techs fix it, whoever's in that end or, and, and that's been kind of the, the, the biggest um, roadblock for us as we, now that we're live, but in the, even in the beginning, when you're trying to work with multiple vendors, you know, we have, we have vendors such as Vesma and Veramatrix and C-Change and, and trying to get all those together. And, and, and ETI was a big part of that, helping us get uh, connected to, to CSG. Um, so, so those are all moving parts that took a while to get it stood up. And now that it's up in the last year and a half, two years, it's been trying to, you know, one makes a change as it impact the other. So it, it keeps our engineers, uh, keeps their plates full for sure um, in a different way. You know, it's not them fixing the problem. They're more, you know, managing if there is a problem. So that, that's definitely one, um, one problem we had. I, I think TiVo has done a good job now. They, they recently acquired Moby TV um, okay. and they're bringing a lot of that in-house. So that definitely would help for anyone that's, you know, a new entrant. Um, we had to do it all over again. Will we do it that way? I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's UI is a little different, but I still, I think it's a great product. I think they've taken a good product and made it a lot better. So what do you think is the, the one big thing that surprised you about TiVo and its reception to, um, from your subscribers? Anything um, I, I think just the, uh, probably the amount of features and them un, un, uncovering the features, you know, it has, okay. we, the, a couple of, couple of things that stand out for me, there's a feature called start over catch up where you can actually go back in time. And, and, and if you forgot to record an episode, you can go back in the guide and record it up to three days, as long as, you know, the programming, con programming contract permits that, okay. um, as well as, uh, you know, you can, let's say instance, we're in the Philadelphia area. So an Eagles game that started, you missed the first half, you can actually click on and start it over again. So a really good, a couple of really good features there. The other thing, um, what we liked about the IP solution is it's cloud DVR. So it's not like you're putting hardware in there and the recording stored on the, on the, on that piece of hardware, it's in the cloud. So you can turn on at DVR, you can turn off DVR. So an another thing ETI helped us with, um, with that solution is, you know, we went all those questions, well, how long do we store it if they take away DVR? Cause they may want to add it back. So all things we, you know, use cases we had to work with, with your team on um, to, to, to figure all that out. But, but another, you know, a complaint we hear a lot from customers is, is you know, if you upgrade your box, you lose your recording. So in this case you do not. So store it in the cloud. No, it's valuable. Thank you for that. And um, I'm sure uh, people will be reaching out for some more tidbits there. Sure. Um, I just want to switch topics now into more of the in-home devices, right? I know you guys have done a lot there and, and see that as pretty significant uh, differentiator for you guys. So, you know, kind of give us a backdrop of what kind of led you down to thinking about understanding of, you know, kind of a more future proof device strategy, in-home device strategy. Sure. I mean, yeah, always something we heard from our teams and, and our front end, you know, customer service reps was, you know, at what level of troubleshooting do we go here? Are customers calling up, I, how do you, you know, where do we get to? Are we helping them with, you know, their gaming consoles, their printers, all of those devices in their home and they're flying blind on the phone with this and, and can't see, see that or see what they're troubleshooting or even just, you know, where, where everything's connected. Um, so we knew we needed something. And, and we also knew that with more devices in customers' homes, we needed a solution that, you know, allowed those devices to connect in a way that, um, you know, the customer was getting the best, the best connection based on where it was located. Um, initially, we looked at, you know, a mesh, a mesh solution, which was from a, um, from a provider that, you know, it, it worked for us. It, it allowed us to, um, you know, to add more, more extensions. And I, I would basically call them extenders in each of the, you know, the rooms in the home. Um, but for us, we, you know, we, we weren't able to we wanted a solution that, you know, when we sold internet and we packaged it with a Wi-Fi device, we wanted that Wi-Fi device to be, the, you know, the piece in the home for, for a long time that would, you know, would adapt to the customer adding more devices because we're seeing growth at, I think I read something a couple of weeks ago that there's almost 20, average user has 20, close to 20 devices, 16 to 20 devices in the home. Right. And that's growing. Um, you know, it's, so we, so we wanted something that, you know, and those devices are getting more powerful to become Wi-Fi 6E devices. So we, you know, we, we then looked at, you know, the Plume solution, which is adaptive technology. And the adaptive technology, basically, instead of having these, you know, static um, devices in the home that were extenders, it actually was adapting to how the user the user's devices were in the home. So it really responds to how the user uses those devices and, and connects to the right Plume device in there. So, and I'm a marketing product guy and I'll tell you that side of it, there's, there's way more in the background that's happening. <laughs> I have to have one of the engineers fully explain, but um, you know, it, to us, it was, 
it, it was kind of a no-brainer and we, we felt like that was also another product we needed to be deploying to our customers. And with that, you know, came an app, but well, but you know, with our, with our legacy provider, um, you know, we were in at two devices at 995 plus the app price. And it was getting cl customers close to $20 on, on the legacy platform we were on. Whereas with Plume, we were able to, you know, offer both Plume super pods, at least two minimum for 995 and the app was included. And, and we just felt like the app was way more robust. Um, it has a lot of features. Um, it, it allows the customer to, and the app itself turns your home into, you know, even a motion sensor. So, you know, they have the guard app that, that you set all your securities, you can set securities for children, for, you know, people, guest networks, it, it sets it up. It's very easy to set up and very easy to use. Um, and then, you know, you can set what, what I did in my house and I think everyone does it differently, but with, with sense, I have all my devices that don't really move in the house as motion sensors. So you can see, you know, dogs moving. You can actually set it dog friendly too. So a lot of really neat stuff in that product that we thought our customers would really enjoy as, as add-ons and, and, and make it a part of their everyday life. So, um, you know, it was, for us, we've, we've been extremely happy with Bloom. Our customers like it, the form factor of it. It's, it's sleek, it's easy, easy to market. Um, our biggest issue lately has been, you know, we were putting in close to 2000 a month and, uh, and then supply chain issues after yeah. COVID made it made it challenging, but we're getting there. So, but still, it's 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 a the product sells itself. Yeah, no, that's that's great background, and it kind of leads us to our next point. So, from uh, lessons learned, you had some legacy uh, experience experience with a legacy provider. You switched to a new one. COVID mm -hmm. hits, supply chain hits. You've mentioned a couple of these things, but you know. From from your perspective, what are the key lessons learned when that you that you've picked up with this relationship with Plume? Um, I mean, for us, it, it the, they're they're a very agile company, so we found that you know during COVID, this was a no brainer for self install. I mean, the app is so intuitive when you set it up, you plug your you know you, you plug your super pod in, and it finds it on the app immediately. You name it, it's good to go. I mean, it's very easy self install. So you know. We, we started doing, you know, we would drop these off at customers' doors or they would pick them up. And now we're starting to, you know, we've been mailing them out to customers. It's an easy self-install candidate. Um, and of course, a customer may have, depending on the size of their home, and our, our teams do a great job of sort of walking the customer through how many pods you need per home. And sometimes they want more, you know, and they're easy to set up when you add it in. So, um, you know, no, no real challenges with, with that, um, but, but certainly a lot of lessons learned. And, from a, I meant to point out from a support perspective, it really does give our teams a viewpoint. Like they have these on the front end and the back end, the customer can see the topology of their network, but on the back end, our, our reps can actually see what devices are connected. And if the customer, a lot of times it picks up the name of the device, so that helps, but you can rename them. And our CSR can say, hey, maybe move this pod this way and that'll help grab those devices or, and, and you'll have a better experience and mm. get better range or, you know, the, our teams do such a great job of, of and, and it helps reduce truck rolls. You know, we're not rolling a truck on that. And, and it, it really helps reduce costs from that perspective. And what's the response from your subscribers? I mean, so there's self-install and, you know, you're getting all this Intel and it's just kind of a sleeker, cooler product. Are you getting that feedback from your, from your, support, your subscribers? Absolutely. So we surveyed our customers um, a few months back and with, a, with sort of an NPS. And we, we typically do two NPSs a year, um, but we are net promoter scores. And we isolated uh, Plume customers on this one. And, you know, our typical, you know, NPS score on internet is most companies are similar is in the low, you know, low, but, you know, four or five, six, maybe lower, depends on the month. Sometimes Bloom customers were, you know, in the 26, 27 range. Wow. They're extremely satisfied with the product. And, and, and for them, they thought they were just taking a survey on internet. You know, that's how we phrased it. But we knew those customers were Bloom customers. So, um, yeah, very, very high NPS score on the, on the product itself. Yeah, no, it's great. So thank you for rolling back and thinking backwards on those challenges. You know, what are you, what are you guys thinking about uh, coming up in the next couple of years? What, what is on the top of the mind for y'all? So we're, right now we're in the process. Um, we're working through because we, we're never going to, you know, fiber of the home is great. It's going to take us a while to get there, build out our pond network. But, you know, we went back, we rebuilt our HFC plan. You know, we, we just completed a good portion of our mid-split project. So, um, you know, that's allowing us for, for more capacity on our HFs, on our, on, you know, on our, on our network. So that was how, how we were able to get to our 1.5 gig speeds, um, get to, you know, get up to um, 85 
megahertz um so we can we can now upload our, our upload speeds are much higher more reliable there's more you know more spectrum there so that, that was a big project for us and it was a lot of work a lot of contractors so and we're still working through that we're, we're done in most areas but um we're you know that was that was a, a big one um you know, I mentioned fiber to the home. So we're building out in, in Greenfield. We're building out in Brownfield, trying to trying to stay competitive because we have competitors coming from everywhere. Um, right. You know, legacy competitors. We've got X Wireless. We've got you know, you know, Elon Musk and his contingent coming with some of those solutions. Starlink. Um, so you know, we're kind of keeping an eye on that. There's a lot of government funding out there for for that that companies are applying for, and we spend you know our legal team spends a little, and you know, and, and, and our management team spend a lot of time identifying, you know, censuses that, hey, we already have service here and we're, we're offering it up to, you know, over gig service. So, um, you know, we try to protect ourselves in those areas, but once again, we can't always stop competitors from coming in and overbuilding us. And, you know, we're, we're hoping to have the best product out there to, to compete. Hey, do you um, see any challenges on the technological side? Like you mentioned VOD, uh, BYOD, bring your own devices, but also mm -hmm. Wi-Fi 6. Are you guys talking about that at all? We are, yeah. We're we're looking at, um, you know, actually. So so Plume's building out their Wi-Fi 6E device. Um, we're testing that right now, and that, that's the future. I mean, you know, bigger, faster. Um, most new devices are built for 6E. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're we're in the middle of testing that right now. So something we're, uh, we're we're going moving towards right now. So, and then lastly, we're we're kind of looking at um, the mobile space. We feel like that's a space that you know. You, you'll see it. You see some of the bigger um, operators in now. Um, you know, it's, it's big, bigger business than you know. Than, and there's definitely options out there for us to you know add another product and, and keep that within the customer you know, customer base. We have the customer relationship, so so we see a play there in wireless. Um, you know, so we're we've been kind of down that path in the last year or so um, as being a you know getting into the mobile space. Interesting. I uh, look forward to hearing more about that. Scott, I want to appreciate taking the time to kind of unpack the, the video and uh, in-home device challenges and lessons learned and, and uh, look forward to uh, catching up in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for meeting with me. Thanks. Take care. Hey, everybody. It's me. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I made the mistake of moving one file off my desktop that created a whole cascade of problems. So lesson learned. Um, anyway, so as I was going to do uh, before I was bitten by the technology gremlin, I want to take you through a tour of the, the Triad 6 UI from a portal standpoint. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, I'm going to shut my video off just to conserve the bandwidth. So hopefully you see this. So anyway, um, you've got these different tiles here that represent the different parts of the system. So we're going to focus initially on the top row. So launch pad is our web UI, uh, right next to that legacy UI. Uh, that is a way to actually run the, the legacy client, but from within the browser, that's probably okay for system admin purposes, but not necessarily if you've got a lot of people still using the Windows client, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for that. Uh, the third tile over the REST APIs. So we do have a new REST uh, host interface and we'll take a peek at that two ways. We'll look at it from both the Swagger uh, open API documentation standpoint, as well as we'll look at it from a Postman collections. And then we have the file, the try file browser there at the top right, um, which is a way to actually through the browser go into the Samba share directory. So let's take a quick look at what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna start with Launchpad. So if I click on that, um, here we get presented. So this system that we're trying to get into has two different databases or orgs, 1000 and 2000. So I can select either one. Um, I will go ahead and I will pick org 2000. And here we see the sign on. Now, in my earlier part of the presentation, you heard me mention that we're now using Key Cloak. So this sign on is actually happening um, through a redirect into Key Cloak. Um, so we get the sign on. And again, all of the uh, permissions, role based security is essentially, you know, being granted. Um, and then there's the token that was exchanged with Triad. So now that I have 
this here. Um, if I wanted to go into say, you know, triad J, go look at, you know, an account, I can do that. Um, that's one option. Um, or I can go into manager, you know, everything is essentially there like it's always been. Um, so <clears throat> pretty straightforward. Now, when I, when I sign out, if I want to switch orgs, I'm going to sign out from org 2000 and that takes me back to the login window. And now I will have to reestablish or re-log in to get into a different database. So if I want to go into org 1000, I will log in again, get new credentials, new token, et cetera. And now I have the ability to navigate through the system um, as I did before. So again, um, it hasn't really changed overall in terms of the navigation. There's just the difference with the user authentication and authorizations. And we'll take a little deeper dive, kind of a peek under the covers of that in a minute. Next, I want to talk about the file browser. So again, for the Samba share directories, um, under the user Seabridge directory, typically most people would access those via the command line. Um, you can now get to them via the browser. So here we see the main root directory, uh, batch. I can navigate in. Here I have an example of a file sitting in this directory. If I want to grab this file, I can just come up here, use the download facility, and now the file is sitting there. Um, similarly, I can get rid of the file, and delete it out of the system, and I can put a file back in just using drag and drop. So here we see this text file list 2022-0901 modern controllers. So if I select that, I can drop it right back in, and there you go. So again, uh, all done through the browser, pretty slick, kind of cool, uh, kind of fun. So if I back out, um, get back into that and just close the browser window and I'm back to the desktop. Okay. Well, let's take a look at some of the APIs that um, I mentioned. So again, for many, many years, we've had a web services API as an inbound interface into Triad. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been working to stand up uh, REST APIs. So we have REST documented a couple different ways. So if you want to come in through this button, this will get you into the um, Swagger, which I think was replaced now. It's called, I think, Open API or something like that. Um, and then I can get into the details of my, my command set. So here we see under the subscriber, you know, fetch information about a subscriber. I can create a new subscriber, delete, and get the subscriber operations. Uh, I can actually, and that's a list of what are the operations that are available to me at any given time, get a list of subscribers, et cetera. So as just to kind of give you some idea, if I click on the put, we can see some of the detail here in the Swagger documentation, scrolling down. Um, here's the array, the data structure, essentially in a JSON format. Um, and then right here at the, in the inset, we have the schema. So if I want to see the detail of different fields, I can take a look at that as well. And that'll show me kind of what's going on here as I navigate through this. So just one example of the REST API documentation that we have available. Um, let me close that. And then we have also, I mean, obviously, Location-based APIs, phone, device. So all the all the standard APIs that you're used to are there. Um, so again, those are part of the solution set. Now, if I close this and I back out of here, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the APIs again, but this time I'm going to do it as a Postman collection. So this collections button down here. Um, just a little different view. Um, these are curl commands. So come in, see it, and you can get into the details. We've got some more surround sound as far as additional information. Um, 
but you can try the commands, play around with them, get, you know, make sure they work the way you need them to work. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. I get out of here. So one thing I didn't mention before, um, kind of coming off the heels of the presentation that we just, so the interview we just heard with Scott Young and Service Electric, um, we did create, and by we, I mean David and his Cracker Jack engineering team, um, an implementation of packet cable. So for anybody that runs um, Doxus uh, on their network, Historically, we've needed a third party management tool um, to be a go between triad and the CMTS. Uh, with packet cable, that's no longer the case. We can actually stand up our own native uh, capability as far as managing the, the CMTSs and you know, essentially providing that element management capability on top of the DOCSIS uh, implementation. The OBAPI, so in my presentation, you heard me talk about OBAPI, the webhook. So we've got the APIs for that. Again, here's the Postman collection. Um, we get into some of the details about you know, what you can do with these. And um, anybody that's interested in learning more about OBAPI, you know, we can have a, a sidebar uh, when it makes sense to do so. Um, but we're happy to sit down and kind of give you a more detailed technical deep dive into that VLS as well. Uh, there's a lot going on here and a lot we can do with it. And we think it has a lot of upside and, and long-term potential. So pretty pretty bullish on, on that part of it. Okay. All right. So we've looked at Launchpad. We looked at the rest. We looked at all these different things. Let's take a look at... Let's go to, let's think, what do I want to do next? Um, all right, we'll go into Grafana. So this is where we're getting now into all of the instrumentation, the monitoring that's happening within the system, right? So as part of the CI, CD world, a, a, another leg of that stool is to do constant monitoring of the application, right? knowing kind of what's going on at all times. So Prometheus underneath the covers is responsible for that. And what we're seeing here is the visual representation of that monitoring. So as I scroll through, you're going to see there's a whole bunch of different you know options in this list. But if we just take one kind of at random, um, this is the informix dashboard so we can start to get some visibility into the triad database as an example now notice the graphs below that or in the in the center section there this is where we start to see you know information happening over time so we can start to do some triage of problems from a time perspective you know when did the problem start when did the problem end when was there a high demand in the system when was there low demand in the system um, but this gives a whole nother dimension to the data that's available to us that we really haven't had previously. Um, another good one to take a look at here is going to be the Kubernetes overview. So this gives us some examples of, you know, what's going on with the different containers and the pods, what's running on the system, you know, uh, is there anything abnormal? Is there anything unhealthy? And we can do some drill down into that information, which is kind of fun. Um, here again, we see some time series detail. So we can you know, look at things over the course of a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, depending on what makes the most sense from a resolution point of view. Um, SNMP stats right here. Um, this one is interesting because I think this speaks to some of the future potential of being able to get telemetry from not just triad and the things that are connected to it, but things that are even you know further out in the network, whether we're talking about OLTs or routers or gateways, right? Starting to pull some stats back um, and with the analyst, analytics capabilities really give some, some power to the bigger picture view of what's happening within the operation. Um, 
kind of bullish about where that's going to go. Um, some more of the details there. Here's a summary slide of Triad, um, seeing kind of what's happening, you know, Triad at a glance, CPU, memory, disk space. Um, and then this final one, which is kind of cool, is where we get into the details of individual controllers. So here we see at the, the middle layer, um, what's been happening with the host interface. So, you know, some transaction volumes, um, response times, et cetera. And then if we go a little lower, we see into the controllers, right? So what's actually happening for the controllers that are on the system? What's currently waiting to process? How many transactions have processed? Uh, are there errors? Were there timeouts? Um, and before too long, when we add in the time series component, we'll be able to you know, use this as a way to go back and troubleshoot problems on a controller specific basis. So lots of good stuff happening here. Um, a little bit below, which we'll come to another day is we can get into things like VOD, purchase counts, revenue streams, pay-per-view, uh, potential call usage, right? Things that are happening on that front. So you can kind of track your revenues to see how you're tracking over time um, according, you know, against your baseline. So that was the, the system side of it. Now we can take a look at the logging. So as I mentioned before, um, logging now is what used to be referred to as the ELK stack, Elastic, Logstash, and Kibana. We've modified slightly. We've replaced Logstash with FluentD. Um, but what this does is, you know, gives you a UI where you can actually go search for logs in the system um, and gives you even a visual representation. And once again, we see this at a time series. So if you look at this more closely, we see that the times are broken up. It's by the minute and then within the minute by in 30 second blocks. And we can see the counts of transactions within each 30 second block. And then if I click inside of that block, it'll do me, it'll provide me with a breakdown where now I'm going into uh, the individual seconds, right? So now we've got it at five second increments. And then once again, I can click in and I can get into the detail of what's actually happening within that. So each time I do that, I'm, I'm zeroing in a little farther, drilling down a little farther, narrowing my scope until eventually I get down to the two transactions that happened at this exact moment with the detail. Um, notice also that some of these items within the logs themselves are highlighted. Those are uh, keywords so or field names, and I can use those up here in my search, and then I can filter. So if I wanted to, say, isolate by a specific subscriber ID, device ID, work number, monitor number, those are the kind of things I'll be able to do using that tool. All right. Um, don't want to spend too much more time. Um, I know we're, we want to keep on pace here. So the last thing I think I'll show is just uh, real quickly, key cloak. So this is where we come in, um, we can subdivide a triad system into the different orgs and set up the users. Um, so here we see a user and then we go into the roles. So this is my user role. And if I click on the client roles and I select Try J, then you can see all the different permissions that I have as part of that user on the system. So um, lots of good stuff, you know, uh, kind of the next generation of our OSS and where we're going from here. So pretty exciting. Um, if you want to, again, dig into more detail, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, and we will be happy to sit down and talk to you guys more. But we definitely think Triad 6 is the real deal, and we're excited to get you, our customers, moving in this direction, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but, you know, I encourage you to reach out to your account rep um, when you're ready to make that, make that move. Um, and with that, 
I will turn it over to my good colleague and friend, Greg Gross, to talk to us a little bit more about some other stuff that he's got cooking on the triad side. Greg? Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Uh, very good job. Um, actually, Chris, before you go, Mitch Blades had submitted a question asking, is everything browser-based at this point from a client perspective? Um, do you want to take that? Yeah, so we're we're still working to finish the overall port of the what was the legacy Windows uh, UI into the web UI. Um, David and his team are actively working on that now, and I will get a date after today's call and let you know what the uh, projected time to completion is. I'm hoping it's by the end of this year, but I will definitely let you know. Thank you. So, okay, hi uh, everyone, I'm Greg Gross. I'm VP of PMO for ETI. Been here a long time, been doing um, product management for most of the time, and that's probably where most of you on the line will remember me. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to say hi, but let me now turn off my camera for the presentation. Um, you can thank me later. Um, so let me just verify, can you guys see my screen? Mary Beth, can you verify? We, I see that, Greg, you're up. You're Got it. Okay. So, um, all right, so today I was gonna talk to you about, it's it's more primarily in the OSS space, again, Triad OSS, um, and I wanted to talk to you about our video service activation and management. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone on the line here will be familiar with that. That is, I think you all have some uh, video management from ETI's Triad platform. Um, but specifically, I wanted to kind of show how it's evolved over the years, and I will mostly be drilling into a single vendor. Oops, hold on, I'm getting slide advancement here. Okay. So as we look at the overall triad footprint of the various technologies that it can support, uh, today we'll be focusing on video, which really drills into these highlighted items here, IPTV, which is kind of the state of the art. We got RF video, video on demand, and video over data, which is, I guess that refers to video on mobile devices and st streaming units, excuse me. <clears throat> so um, to showcase this and, and give us the best view, I'll be focusing on TiVo. Uh, we've spent the last two to three years working with TiVo to, and a couple of our customers to build a very comprehensive interface to their technology. Um, it, it really does everything, I guess you could say, from a, you know the video perspective. It's it's kind of the goal we've been reaching for all along. You want to get um, you know all video across all devices, and then they even have merged it with Android uh, set top boxes that allow you to have Netflix, HBO sort of integrated to the user experience. Um, TiVo has been a great partner to work with, um, and the customers that we've had have had a long time to uh, help sift through a lot of issues and uh, bring together a very comprehensive system that is working very well. Um, the complications come in that TiVo's not a, um, while, they, while they offer video across all devices and a very smooth and slick interface, it does require support from a lot of different vendors. Uh, and even the TiVo existence itself has five separate endpoints, uh, plus a QBTV for video on demand, which is actually a TiVo product now. And we also have to talk to Vera Matrix for DRM and then evolution for set-top box management. So to bring this to life requires a lot of moving parts, um, but it's worth it. Um, as we move forward here, so... Uh, Simplicity can be complex. So as we've been talking about video from on any network, which is fiber or RF to any device, which is anything from mobile to a set-top box in the home, and TiVo's done it. They've made a nice, simple user interface. It's intuitive. Uh, it's familiar. It's got cloud DVR. So everything, you know, when you record something anywhere, you can access it anywhere. And we got this nice, beautiful system. And then once you let the users loose on the system, that's what you end up with. Um, so ETI's role is to help untangle the mess and try to make it uh, manageable and simple for everyone. So as we zoom into the um, specifics here, 
I've got a um, an, over an, an architectural overview of the whole footprint here. So over on the left here, we've got what uh, your stuff. So that's our customers, the ISP, that's their back office integrations uh, and existing systems. In the center here, we've got ETI. That's what we bring to the table. And if you look carefully, you'll see that OSS is really one small block in the picture here when it comes to TiVo. We've actually had to build a lot of surround sound in order to support it and uh, make it usable. Um, <clears throat> then you've got TiVo Cloud. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of endpoints within the TiVo Cloud. Plus across the bottom, we've got evolution, set-top box management. We've got DRM that we have to hit for bare matrix in order to set some values there. And then if you still are using QAM, we've got to talk to your DNCS, DAC, you know, whatever the traditional QAM system is. So, um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, you know. I mean, literally every time you refresh a subscriber, uh, if we get to this next slide, every time you refresh a subscriber, it can generate 20 to 30 transactions going to four or five vendors. So, you know, while the user is looking at something that's great, behind the scenes putting it together was was rather complex. So <clears throat> when we're talking about supporting QAM and IP linear in parallel, um, it, from TiVo's perspective and from this particular interface, it doesn't matter. We assume everything's gonna have everything. So when we're provisioning one, we just set it up as if it's gonna have support for RF as well as um, IP linear. And um, the way we do that is we just set up the account and all the entitlements and the DVR, everything that's necessary. And then the services and the set tops come in behind it and they'll just adapt to what we've already configured. Um, additionally, you know, some of the other challenges when you bring in mobile and other things into the, into the play here is you've got emergency alert and NDVR. These are cloud services. So they're not tied to a piece of physical equipment inside the home. EAS, I can travel and I still need to make sure that the alerts come in based on my location. And NDVR is cloud, so I have to make sure that, uh, you know, I record something from a set top. Now I want to watch it from my mobile device, um, which might not even be in my home. You know, is that possible? And if so, how do I make it work? So those are some of the challenges that we've had to fake, uh, face and why we've had to do a lot of work to get there. Um, so one of the key elements in the TiVo ar architecture is this entity called a PPS, which is a partner provisioning service. Um, essentially what happens is every time a set top comes online, it hits a PPS request. So the request goes straight from TiVo to ETI. So we've had to write a listening service that we host. Uh, we usually host it on site at the customer. So each one of our customers has their own PPS infrastructure hosted by ETI, provided by ETI. Um, and it receives real-time requests from the field, from TiVo, to onboard devices. If we don't respond, the device doesn't come online. So, you know, it's, it, it's an urgent service that must be 100% available in order for the system to work. A PPS transaction is triggered whenever a device boots up. If it's a mobile device, whenever they authenticate or log in. Um, it happens whenever they change a the network. So if I'm on my mobile device and I switch from Wi-Fi and leave the house and now I'm on IP, it will issue another PPS request. And then periodically it will issue one every day if one hasn't been issued from some other triggering event. So it's very active service. It's constantly receiving requests. And what we have to do is we have to collect the requests, get information, and then send a response. Of course, there's a different flow and different requirement for every different device type. So it adds some complexity to the PPS infrastructure um, and it varies based on the technology. So I'm not going to bore you with these flows. This presentation will be made available, but I will just touch on them at a high level and say that we've got a different flow for PPS with a set top box, which basically the device here triggers a request to TiVo when it comes online, and then TiVo sends us PPS requests. PPS is integrated tightly with Triad, and it will collect the information it needs to provision the set-top and send back a response. Uh, and that, again, happens in real time. Success or failure responses, either way, uh, TiVo takes what we respond with and then executes based on the response. The flow for mobile devices has different steps into it, but 
it's, it's similar, but we do have different responses. And the first thing you'll notice here is that the TiVo IDP, I mean, the customer's IDP, that would be your identity management server, must allow the subscriber to log in from the TiVo app. Um, and then it triggers a similar PPS flow, which is through here, back to the account. Um, we can also, with mobile devices, as as they're not added by a CSR, you don't call up and say, hey, I want to add my, 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 my iPad or my iPhone to my account. They do have limits of the number of mobile devices that you are allowed to have on an account. So one of the things we've done is we've actually built a system to enforce that limit. And we will, if the limit is exceeded, we basically kick off the oldest device. And what does that mean? So we kick off the device that connected longest ago. So every time a device connects, we record that connect time and whichever, if, you, if you're allowed to have 10 devices, when the 11th device connects, it looks at the longest, the oldest connect time and we'll just drop that device. Um, we also have to account for scenarios where a subscriber may sell their device to another subscriber who will then try to log in and access the service. Um, we don't know that sale happened, so we can't delete the device from the account so we actually have to trigger that in real time and say, okay, well, this device now belongs to a new subscriber. I have to clean it up off the old account and add it to the new one. So I'm trying to trying to just illustrate here the amount of extra you know, edge cases that came up as we were building support for this uh, new technology. So that's PPS for mobile. There's PPS in device binding. Um, we've got this thing called license plate binding. So some of you are probably familiar with this. I know Showtime and Hulu do this, that when I wanna add, uh, when I try to log in from a Fire Stick, for example, um, I go to uh, the application, it says, hey, you wanna sign in? It pops up like a five or six digit code. And it tells you go to hulu.com slash activate. And then you have to type in the code and go through your authentication process. Well, it's very similar here with uh, the TiVo um, device binding license plate binding service. Uh, essentially, when you launch the app, if you're not authenticated, and this is from a Fire Stick or some device, usually the device is not, not a mobile device like a, an iPhone or an iPad because you've got a keyboard on those. You can just type in your credentials. But when you don't have a Fire Stick, all you've got is a remote control with you know the, the minimum amount of, amount of buttons they typically don't pop up a keyboard and have you type it in. They'll send you to a website where it's easier to get those credentials authenticated. Once it's done, it goes through a nice complicated flow to get things activated, um, but it definitely, it all works. So um, those are the various services that we've had to add to support uh, TiVo's PPS. And again, this comes up every time. And if we don't respond uh, when adding a device, uh, it doesn't get added. So uh, the next piece we've had to add for our, to our infrastructure to support TiVo is this thing called in-home detection. It's, it's really location verification. Um, I think Scott mentioned this in his video that when subscribers are out of the home, um, you know, certain content providers may not allow you to access their content. Uh, it certainly changes what you're allowed to view if you're out of the home. Also, you know, what's, what's blocking you from taking an IP set top box that's you know a managed device provided by the service provider. What's 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 blocking you from ordering an extra set top and giving it to your friend who lives next door? So those are the reasons that we do location verification. We have to verify that a subscriber that every device when it boots up and logs in that it's in the subscriber's home. If it's not, if it's a set top box, we turn it off. It's not allowed to be activated. If it's a mobile device, we say okay, well. You know, you're out of home and we tell TiVo it's not in the home, but it's still in region, which would be in the USA. We also detect if it's in the USA or not. And then TiVo will, using their infrastructure, determine which content is allowed to be accessed. Um, this happens, again, for both mobile and set-top box devices. And out of home set-top boxes will not boot. I mean, they boot, but they don't go into allowing you access to content. This again is another flow diagram for that. As the set top comes up, it flows through the service and it actually hits this in-home detection server. This is another real-time service that we provide. It's a listener that TiVo will hit real-time. We get transactions uh, through whatever um, 
intensity and, and frequency that they will send it. Um, several things trigger an in-home detection requests like PPSs are triggered every time someone logs in or switches network. In-home detection pretty much parallels those triggers. So we get a lot of requests every day. We have to verify that it's on the device. And this was, uh, you know, not only do we have to verify that it's on the subscriber's account, because what we get is a WAN IP address and a subscriber ID. So we have to verify that those two things are tied together. Um, depending on which customer of ETI you are, we may know all the IP addresses because we provision them in your access network, or we can reach into Radius or DHCP or you know, pick your IP management solution uh, and, and dip into that and get those, in, those details pulled out and verify whether it's in home or not. We have some, some of our sub customers will have 10 different ways to verify IP equals location. Um, you know, that can be a very complex algorithm unto itself. Um, but either way, we can, we're, we're well situated to help you work that out. And then once we get that information, we verify whether it's in region, which there's actually a um, kind of scary IP address database that you can go to that will tell you exactly where you are based on your IP address. So we dip into that in real time, send out back a response to TiVo, and then you come online if you're in region and in home. Um, <clears throat> the last big sus subsystem to talk about is pay-per-view. Pretty straightforward here, but you know, again, pay-per-view support across RF and IP introduced some fun challenges. Um, we have to verify subscriber and credit limit, just like always. We also have to do a schedule management push. Um, so we have to notify your different um, uh, TiVo of your different of the schedule in all your different areas, all your different channels. It's the same monthly schedule management we do for other technologies. We now offer it for TiVo. Um, more flows here, which I'll just let you dig out on the um, when you receive the, the the device. But it supports order ahead from CSR or from like a web page banner. You can put on your web page, hey, you know, order the fight here. They click on it, and they would be able to get the order. Um, and CSR support for cancellation, as well as IP pay-per-view, which, uh, excuse me, impulse pay-per-view, which is supported from the set-top box. Additionally, and lastly, we support QBTV. Uh, QBTV is a fully separate and, you know, standalone entity in a sense. Uh, it's provided by TiVo. It's integrated on that side, but for us, it looks just like if it were see change or error. So we have a full integration that has to manage accounts, devices, entitlements, do all the purchase collection, as well as the, uh, the DRM integration to Veramatrix to make sure those devices are secure. Um, and there's VOD flows that you can look at. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, as you expand. So one, one of the things that I would love to take credit for, but I actually owe some of our customers, uh, specifically uh, uh, Missy from CBT and Chris from uh, SCCV, we actually ran into several issues while we we're building this out um, in the flow of the project, but providing solutions for those made the system really versatile and easy to expand. Um, as a, an example of that, um, as we were recently had a kickoff for CBT to um, show us that they were adding a very large new territory onto their existing footprint. So this being what we built and deployed for CBT that's up and running, that's already in place, they add on this entirely new territory with as many or more subscribers, TiVo subscribers as they already have, um, it added a lot of arrows and a lot of boxes um, to the mix that we would have to support in order to support this new territory. But for ETI, and again, this is in progress, so I'm not trying to spike the football yet, but so far it appears that our entire growth footprint is only going to be one additional server, which we need because there's different in-home detection flows that we need or process that we need to deal with for the new territory. But uh, again, doubling the footprint, adding a lot of support for new set tops and subscribers. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be a very simple and streamlined process. And again, this comes because of the planning and the execution that we did on the first project. So that's all I got. Thanks for your time, everyone. If you have any questions, most of you know how to reach me. 
Um, let me switch back here. Just say bye. Um, and then I'm handing this off to David Tidd, our VP of Engineering, uh, and he's going to talk about Triad Roadmap. Take it away, David. Uh, yes, um, my name is David Tidd. I represent the engineering group here in Norcross, and I'm going to discuss uh, Triad Mission and Roadmap. It's not really uh, changing a whole lot, as you would expect. Our mission really is to solve complex problems for 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 you operators and providers. Um, that's not going to change. We're really uh, uh, excited about what we do and how we're doing it. I think we have three major areas that we want to focus in and continue focusing on, and that's Triad, uh, Triad OE, which is our DevOps kind of outlet and our flagship uh, low code solution, the business logic service, which is produced. I mean, we're ecstatic about the results that it has produced for us. And we're doubling down on our low code uh, solution set because of that. Some things you heard earlier, like Plume and uh, Adtran uh, Mosaic's cloud platform and Nokia Alti Plano and Calyx, Axos, SMX, these are all SDN, software-defined networking technologies. And it's really exciting stuff. Um, and we tend to, we want to focus on that. We know it's going to allow us to bring more virtualization and services to the edge, additional integrations and things with, for our business logic service to consume on all around Triad on your behalf. We also want to add into our into our DevOps suite that you just saw in Triad 6. We'll add a couple of additions for a headless CMS, probably for some scanning and auditing and vulnerabilities and configuration, some things like that, the network service mesh, some observability. But the biggest thing is we're trying to help you be efficient in what you do. Um, to tell you that we're passionate about software-defined networking and what that does for us, I can tell you one of the biggest things that has changed is the, the, the declarative uh, paradigm and programming model. And what, what's different about that is you state what the end goal is. What is the desired state? And that frees up uh, other teams to act on your behalf for things like service assurance, for monitoring and, and, and reporting, right? Um, so maybe three activities can be happening at the same time instead of the traditional imperative way where we describe how do we get to that end result. I think the declarative thing is what's led the Kubernetes explosion in virtualization and the SDN has embraced that tightly as well. It's the key to its, its model-driven service activation layer and how services and devices and things are modeled. And that's really exciting. As Chris was telling you, there's a number of, of uh, scalability and, and redundant fault-tolerant solutions. I think the SDN is moving into the fabric, which is, I know it is, and it's very exciting. Uh, don't forget, as you move and add high availability things, uh, the the techniques done in the past, like, like, like dual homing your servers and things like that, those, those principles still hold true as we move forward. We're just trying to have more and more options for redundancy and scalability. And we have so much more uh, opportunities to observe what's happening that gives us more uh, chances to act on your behalf. So it's really exciting. The SDN's moving into the fabric. It's moving into, into to core technology. So, so what's another thing that's happening? Well, you'll see hardware abstraction is going on, and this is also another big fire that is 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 being produced 
by software defined networking. And it's exciting as Plume and as exciting as Mosaics. Now, granted, a lot of people, as soon as you say white box equipment, they start to panic. But really, what this technology is going to bring is going to bring simulators and and um, virtualization and emulation that will help the resiliency of the services that you deliver take on a whole new uh, class. And that's really exciting. The other exciting thing is that you'll find as standards are embraced by all these different hardware companies that they're building um, the smallest, fastest switches and the smallest, fastest ONTs and, and making them as lightweight and as efficient as possible. And what happens from uh, a data aggregation point of view is all your northbound interfaces end up starting to look similar as opposed to them looking different everywhere. And again, that's alignment the SDN brings um, uh, on control and management is it's trying to bring those control and services into one place where you can take advantage of it. The other thing that's happening that's real exciting is they're all drinking the same Kool-Aid. I mean, the Yang models, it describes everything about the interface, the protocol, the communications. So that's being applied everywhere across the board. It doesn't matter if you're broadband, if you're trying to do some CBRS, you know, uh, light communications, or if you want to go full 5G or some LTE version in the middle. A lot of your tools are going to be the same. The challenges that we face are going to be similar. So it's kind of exciting because if handled right, it's going to give you more opportunity to succeed than ever before. And I think it's going to bring all the, what you'll see is there's a lot more east-west traffic. You know, if you think about north-south traffic being the computer to the person, there's a lot more east-west traffic. So as Greg was sharing, there may be 25 different east-west traffic things to make TiVo work. And that can happen and be very efficient and, and bring services together from all over to make them very rich and the experience great. I'm totally stoked on that. And the biggest thing is I wanted to thank you because none of this, you make all this give us a purpose and um, this passion and the service we have for you would have nowhere to go um, without this community. So thank you for that. And with that, I'd like to announce, uh, we're gonna show you a video celebrating ETI's 30th anniversary. So uh, we cherish the opportunity to serve. Thank you.
Hey there, this is uh, Greg Aston. Uh, I'm a product director at ETI. I'm going to be kicking off uh, our SMP side of the user group. And the first thing we're going to look at today is uh, unified device management in SMP. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with SMP, our service management platform at this point. Um, but I'm going to be looking at some of the specifics of how we're interacting with devices and providing views for users of devices, allowing them to interact with things remotely uh, and all of that. So I'll uh, move ahead with the presentation and uh, we'll, we'll stop the webcam for now. So getting into unified device management. So in the world of SMP, where we've taken Microsoft Dynamics and customized it for telecoms, uh, we've added a lot of functionality around managing of remote devices and remote equipment that you might have deployed. Really, the, the aim of SMP as a whole is to provide a single pane of glass for your business, for your telecom business specifically, uh, and devices are a, a key part of that. So we've also looked to provide that single pane of glass view where we can pull in devices and telemetry and information from a wide variety of sources and, and source devices uh, and provide them through a single user interface where we can provide specific views for different types of users. Now, looking at this very high level diagram here, you can get an idea of some of the kind of information that we'll pull in. So using Dynamics, we have access to a lot of standard IoT functionality. So there's a whole wide variety of IoT equipment and devices that you can manage through Azure and all the capabilities there. So we're able to natively bring all of that into uh, the service management platform. So as you look to expand your IoT capabilities in future, we have that future proofing there uh, so we can bring all of that equipment in but for all of our traditional telecoms equipment so things like customer premise uh, devices or any of the equipment that's connected to the OSS so things like the fiber network as Chris was mentioning earlier what we're looking to do is collect data from those sources and bring those back. We use our Beamfly platform that may be something that some of you have come across before but that allows us to provide different views, dashboards, historic data, the kind of stuff that, that Chris was showing earlier. And we've typically done that with those customer premise devices. So your Wi-Fi gateways in the home, that type of thing. But now we're expanding that out to include a wide variety of other equipment. And the general aim is that anything that a user within, within SMP may need to view or interact with, we can all pull back into that common interface and also allow any uh, provisioning actions that need to take place and, and have a level of ag aggregation there so we can move between different elements as needed. Now, critically, we don't want our customers day in, day out to have to think about all of the protocols and all of the underlying uh, functionality that's going on there. It's really about users and what they need to get to and what they need to see. So to give you an idea of the kind of stakeholders who get involved in the data that we have in the unified device management side of things, it's, it's really anyone with a need for quality of service data or a need to directly interact with equipment. So taking the example of, say, a field service technician, they may be managing devices through a, a mobile app. So when if they, if they go to do an install, they can go test, validate equipment that they put on site, ensure that connections are working correctly. And all of this action or all of this activity is logged back into SMP. So when we go look at an account, go look at a customer's history, we can see all of that detail about how the install happened, what was installed on site, along with all of the testing and, and activity that went on directly using the device and the equipment on site, uh, all triggered from a, a mobile application. It's all very handy in the field and easy to interact with for a field service tech to get that sort of day one install done or even validate any equipment and status any equipment while they're fixing any issues out in the field. Now, when it comes to a CSR agent, they're going to be in the office, but they're still going to want to get a view of what's happening with the customer's device currently or any historic information as well. So we provide a lot of historic data and we do a lot of alarms and alerting through the system as well. So again, you can go back and see what the experience of the customer has been over time uh, and understand what their pain points have been so you can really react to the experience that they've had using your service. 
There's also the ability to remotely trigger uh, actions where possible. Of course, this all depends on the equipment and the protocols, but that's really our domain and our thing to worry about. So we want to get everything that we can hooked up and let you start triggering these actions. So again, we provide these user interfaces where a user can instantly see whether a device is online, offline, or the current status is, uh, pull any of the latest data from the device, and also have one-click actions to update the device, do any provisioning that's required. And when it comes to IT teams, we also have data in aggregate as well. So where we may be speaking with many different disparate pieces of equipment, we can then provide those in a combined view. So you can see across the network averages of what's been going on or look for any patterns. This becomes especially important when it comes to the digital twinning capability that we have in Dynamics. So we're tracking a lot of unmanaged equipment as well as managed equipment and tracking the relationships between those devices so that if we see 20 downstream devices from one upstream device fall over, then we can infer that there's a problem with that upstream device. So it allows a, a full view of the network uh, through all of this information that we're collecting from a variety of sources. Uh, and we also do things like usage analysis and comparisons of different equipment. Wherever we're collecting stats and we can provide comparisons that are going to help you make good business decisions going forward, then that's exactly what we'll do. Now, I mentioned the alerting and alarming capability in there. Uh, I know later on, Ryan and Brad are going to show you some awesome stuff where we take that data and display it in different ways or use it in a lot of the capability that we get out of Dynamics. One of those capabilities is the AI analysis of alerts and alarms. So as we're pushing events into the system to say things are happening with devices uh, the system is going to analyze those and also analyze what users do on the back of those alerts as well so things typically lead to a case being raised or certain actions being taken the system can learn and then suggest those types of actions in the future as well this is an area that we're really looking to explore as much as possible we know microsoft are putting a lot of money into their uh, ai capabilities and it is a perfect match for the kind of devices that we have out in the telecom world and the kind of metrics that we collect for them. Uh, so this is going to be a very natural fit and something that will continue to develop in the future and will be a, a real focus of our unified device management. Now, I talked about UDM very much about CPU devices. There, there are tangential things related to it as well. So where we're mapping all of these resources that you have within your network and within your business we want to map as many of those into the service management platform as possible so through the kind of capabilities that we we do in udm we can connect out to different line of business systems so we can be pulling information back from various different sources and representing them in smp and again defining the relationships that they have with any other objects that we're tracking uh, on the provisioning side, of course, Triad being a huge piece of this and the added API capabilities of, of Triad and the progression in the systems that we're integrating to and the development of additional information that we collect is just going to add fuel for this going forward. So we want to pull, pull in more and more information uh, and use that capability that we have through Triad to get out there, collect as much information as we can and bring it back to this single platform. Now, I mentioned the IoT side of things. Azure and Dynamics has a lot of IoT capability, uh, so we want to keep all of that in the mix. We know that IoT devices and the expansion and, and ever-growing number of IoT devices is going to become a factor for everyone going forward. So where you do have manageable equipment that you can address, uh, we'll be using the tools that are available through the Microsoft Toolkit uh, to support those and again, bring those into that common view. So whether you're looking at a traditional telecom device device or an IoT device, you can have a very similar experience uh, through the platform uh, and not require very disparate user training to, uh, to move between these different device types. It's all about putting it in the context of the subscriber, putting it in the context of the account. 
Now, where we're managing devices, I mentioned we're managing other resources. Those can even be things like IP addresses. So this thing that we're doing for customers where we're managing blocks of different IP addresses, allowing those to be allocated to different customers, and again, triggering any kind of API actions on the back. So again, where I mentioned the logical resources of mapping different resources within your business into the system, that's a, a prime example of that. And the same goes around voice service as well. We do a lot of management of phone numbers and, and that, those kind of resources that you'll need for voice within the system. Uh, so this is an area that we'll continue to expand on, but it's, uh, it was is one of the core components of SMP in terms of things that we've added and developed to the dynamic stack. Uh, so we have a lot of use case support for things around uh, number porting and the handling of phone numbers through the system. Uh, and as I mentioned on the Beamfly side, Again, some of you may have heard of that in the past, and it's something that we've traditionally done with the CPE side and, and some of the more traditional device management pieces. But what we really want to do is expand that out to be a platform where we can, again, put all of the data into a common interface. And really, depending on the type of user that you are, that's going to define how you approach that data, how you interact with it day by day. Uh, but this should all be a seamless experience across any user interfaces that we provide. Now, to give you a bit of a live look around of the system uh, and show you some of that user interface, uh, we've got a video lined up here. So this is a conversation between Pete Pizzatillo uh, and myself that took place recently. Uh, so Mary Beth, if you don't mind, uh, could you please queue up the video? Greg, we um, hear a lot from our customers in the marketplace about swivel chair, you know, people trying to use multiple systems to do one job or one business process. Um, it's something I know that you've been dealing with our customers with. So how are you helping folks eliminate the need for having to do, you know, to have a swivel chair? A lot of the market likes to use buzzwords like a single source of truth or a 360 degree view of your business. Uh, the problem is that internet service providers typically have the best of breed approach or a mix of proprietary and commercial systems, which get the job done, but also create inefficiencies and create brittle, hard to maintain architectures and prevent employees from having a real time understanding of their clients and business. This is one reason why we tailored Microsoft Dynamics to the telecommunications industry. It's truly an end-to-end -end solution uh, for communication providers of all sizes. But to get back to your question of swivel chair, let's have a look at the account view of a subscriber. Now, this could be an individual, a business, or a multi-dwelling unit. But in this example, let's have a look at an individual or home. This gives us all the basic information we need to validate a customer's identity, service, and billing status. Can also view their location information as well as the timeline of any actions that have been taken on the account to help steer us towards any useful customer service info. Based on the customer's timeline, we can dig into any related work orders. This will allow us to see any actions that have taken place, when those were performed, and which of your colleagues have performed any of the required work. We can also view any tickets previously raised by the customer. This could be from a variety of sources, including anything that's been captured on a phone call, via emails, or web portals. All of that can be displayed here and help provide the backstory of a customer's journey so far. Looking at the case view, we can see any data that was captured during previous interactions with the customer and any work orders that were generated as a result. If we want to get an understanding of what is happening with any devices that are deployed at the customer premise, we can also view the device management page. This has embedded views where I can make any configuration changes that are required for a customer. Uh, this also allows diagnostic testing, any reprovisioning that's required. We can also view any historical stats that have been collected from the device and help diagnose issues. We can also view any additional details relating to the device. Critically, this all ties back to the original account where we started. All of this data combined into a single user interface that has the customer relationship to provide a full overview of the customer's experience. The system allows you to understand not just what the customer is reporting today, but what their previous experiences that have been with the internet service provider, all without having to move between multiple systems and resolving that swivel chair issue.
Okay, so uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, up next, we have All Points Broadband CFO, Brandon Ogilvy. He's going to share his views on the evolving challenges of uh, fin uh, broadband financial leaders uh, in today's marketplace. So, uh, yeah, we hope you enjoy. Thank you for joining us today. I have a I'd like to welcome a special guest, Brandon Ogilvy. He's the CFO of All Points Broadband. Brandon, thanks for joining our conversation today around financial transformation. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, we're going to dig in a little bit about what you and All Points are dealing with uh, in today's marketplace. But before we get started, it'd be really helpful to just kind of unpack what or who All Points Broadband is, and then we can get a little bit into who you are and why you joined. Uh, certainly. So All Points Broadband was formed in 2014 with the mission of delivering high quality broadband internet access to unserved and underserved uh, people living in rural markets. And uh, during the first five or six years of the company's uh, existence, the company built a very stable, robust platform uh, and service in the mid-Atlantic region, serving primarily Virginia, Kentucky, uh, with some customers in West Virginia and Maryland as well, uh, using predominantly fixed wireless technology to deliver uh, internet data service to our customers. No, that's great. And and you've joined uh, All Points Broadband in the last 18 months, and you have a pretty uh, interesting background. So what is it that drew you to back into the infrastructure and broadband space? And specifically, what's the opportunity that you saw with All Points? Yeah, so uh, as by way of background, I started my career uh, originally undergrad uh, as a civil engineer. Uh, so I always have been attracted towards infrastructure projects. I uh, did return to get my MBA about midway through my career. And uh, after that, I, joined, I entered the renewable energy industry in about the 2008 timeframe, where I worked for about eight years uh, on large infrastructure projects, uh, but on the finance side and uh, really had a passion for those infrastructure projects. Uh, I switched industries in the 2016 timeframe, but this opportunity with All Points came along uh, in 2021 and I jumped on it. I really liked what they were doing. It had that uh, appealed to my personal uh, preference for large infrastructure projects and uh, happened to know some of the original founders and principals of, of the firm. And so it was overall a, a good fit uh, for me when I decided to join last year. Yeah, and we hear that a lot these days of folks coming and being drawn to this kind of mission-driven work to really help the underserved and unserved space and bring those talents from other markets into the space. So appreciate that. Um, with that, there's a lot going on, right? So there's um, what we're seeing in the marketplace is these really aggressive schedules to build out and get service to to these markets and communities that lack have been lacking for many years. Um, but with that, what we're seeing is uh, network operators Coming to coming to the market with ideas about um, how do you, how do you do this with a reduce a focus on reducing operation expense, right? Trying to find ways to build sustainable, affordable mar um, capabilities that last 10, 20, 30 years, um, as well as focusing on reducing uh, complexity, be it on the IT system side as well as on the business process and operational side. Looking at ways to consolidate uh, processes, adopt standards, so that you have the efficiencies and the ability to um, do more with less, right? And I, I know you guys have kind of embodied some of those concepts, but right, you know, what I'd like to start with is um, your your aggressive plans to grow and transform. You know, can you give us a little bit of an update of kind of where you guys are and kind of the next steps? Certainly. So uh, beginning several years ago, even before COVID uh, occurred, the Commonwealth of Virginia put in place several pieces of legislation to ultimately designed to, to close that digital divide, uh, where the rural markets that are unserved and underserved, uh, that Virginia created several special programs to help businesses such as ours partner with uh, the local counties and municipalities to be able to uh, fund uh, wireline improvements. So wireline-based broadband, which is predominantly fiber optic-based broadband. 
So beginning in 2019, uh, we were working with several localities and then of course COVID hit and, and that has just accelerated and expanded the amount of resources that uh, the federal government and the state governments have made available in this space. Uh, but we had started that transition and, and focus on, uh, on, on pivoting from a fixed wireless operation to a fiber operation back in 2019. Fast forward it to now, this uh, the amount of growth that we anticipate is significantly larger than what we had first envisioned uh, would have been feasible back in 2019 before this additional funding was made available through uh, the American Rescue Plan and more recently BEAD. That growth uh, caused us to then look internally at our own systems and our infrastructure and our business processes and when we evaluated what we have put together on the fixed wireless side, while we're using an industry standard uh, uh, billing platform and an industry standard uh, accounting e ERP system, uh, they didn't talk to one another. And in the billing platform, it really focused on billing and had some ticketing and field dispatch capabilities, but we as a company had developed a number of homegrown solutions kind of wrapped around these systems uh to to really enable our field personnel with uh, information on their cellular devices that are out there doing home installs or or working on a radio tower to to repair it right as we're looking ahead to what's coming down the pipe with our pivot and focus now in, in these fiber rural fiber deployments the uh it became pretty apparent to us that the scale of growth meant that we wanted to we need to focus on that growth and not on expanding and continuing to develop these homegrown internal systems to support uh, scaling up the enterprise. And so that led to us searching uh, back in mid-2021, starting to search for a, uh, an out-of-the-box solution that could handle uh, our range of needs from start to finish. No, it's helpful. Yeah. The, um, so kind of where are you on that adoption of, I know you've been a customer for us since, uh, with us since January, um, mm -hmm. you know, taking that platform approach, but you guys have done it in, in kind of a sequential way. I mean, to kind of, can you give us a timeline of the adoption that you guys have, have taken and where you see it going? Yeah, certainly. So we started the search uh, in the spring of 2021. We evaluated about half a dozen platforms uh, and, and each platform has its strengths and weaknesses. There's a number of good platforms out there. What attracted us to the ETI solution was that it was based in the Microsoft Dynamics architecture. The hosting was provided by Microsoft, and it included not just your classic OSS BSS functionality, but it also included the full uh, ERP solution that Microsoft provides called Business Central, which is its middle market uh, accounting ERP system. So by late summer, uh, we had made the decision to engage with ETI on a full uh, soup to nuts implementation, not just OSS, BSS, but also field service modules, marketing modules, uh, worked with ETI and integrating with uh, our preferred merchant processor and also on the accounting system. With this, we uh, timed it so that we engaged with ETI, and by in the September, October timeframe, by January 1, we were live on the ERP system in Microsoft Business Central. So we rolled out first and foremost with the accounting software, uh, in part timed to match our fiscal year end. Okay. But we launched with that component of it because we really wanted to have all the building box in place so that once the various modules within the OSS BSS as billing and field service came up, they had a place to automatically uh, um, synchronize and, and record the transactions, the financial transactions that are occurring in the OSS BSS side to be able to record it in the accounting system automatically on day one of bringing up those systems. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, you mentioned a, a couple of things. So payment processing, you guys have some interesting thoughts on on your processing. What 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 are the things that you think about in terms of kind of where current and future payment processing capabilities are uh, right now in this market? 
The so uh, when we first started working with ETI, there were a couple payment processors that ETI had uh, had been working with prior to us coming along. What we are finding, and in this space where there's going to be a lot of project finance involved, uh, which means um, working with banks as lenders, uh, those lenders in the project finance space, uh, they often will also stipulate uh, that you will use them for treasury services. You will use them for your merchant processing services. And so in some discussions with ETI and, and bringing them up to speed on what was happening and evolving in the project finance space, uh, uh, it became pretty apparent that whether it was All Points Broadband or any of ETI's other customers that they're probably gonna come to the table and say, I need you to use this merchant processor because of not the merchant, merchant processing processor relationship in particular, but because it's part of a broader banking relationship that right. ETI's clients have. And so uh, with that, uh, I, working with the ETI personnel and senior management, they went through the review and evaluation and they, and they recognized that this was probably going to be a need. And even though it represented an architecture change for them, um, they proceeded with, with implementing uh, this change. And I believe now that the solution that has been implemented gives ETI the flexibility to integrate with basically uh, most any merchant processor out there. Right. So you're all, you're coming up on about a year of your decision process, right? Um, so um, it's been a, I'm sure, a crazy journey, uh, highs and lows. You know, what are some of the key lessons learned that you you can share with the, our listeners? The well, I think the sequencing of bringing up the accounting system first was uh, a strong benefit. Um, the there there because of the data that's passed back and forth uh i think early on in the process a valuable exercise is to understand those relationships and to work with eti to really understand the relationships between each of the components and modules and how they're ultimately ultimately going to interact so whether it's interacting in terms of how gl accounts are passed back and forth or item and inventory codes are passed back and forth coming up with a standardized structure and approach early on uh, can save a lot of uh, redos or restarts down the road. And um, for non-financial leadership that may be listening to this, um, trying to help them understand, um, to help guide their finance teams, you know, it, you know what, what should folks start doing now? You know, it's kind of late fall, you know, you got year end to close kind of things in terms of helping them understand the system evaluation, you know, what, what, what can they start doing tomorrow to kind of start moving in this direction? Any suggestions? I mean, are you asking from the standpoint of if someone out there is evaluating the system for the first time? Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're the liaison to the CEO and to the board and those folks um, and, and in your role, what if, you know, what are, you <laughs> If somebody knew these three things that would make your life easier, you know, what would that what would that yeah. look like? So this type of sol solution uh, affects every department within the company. Okay. Getting stakeholder involvement by creating a multidiscipline interdepartmental team of internal personnel who represent each department, but who are also influencers and drivers in each area is critical uh, because they're. Uh, Anytime you overhaul your back office systems like this, you're also overhauling all of your business processes and how those human beings interact with those systems systems, and how they go about doing their day-to-day -day business. And so getting in place that multidisciplined interdepartmental team is key, mapping out the business process flows of what you do today, and then work with ETI. And I found that working with the ETI team, uh, it, these are a lot of smart, passionate, hardworking individuals, they've taken business process flows of ours, looked at them and said, okay, using our solution, this is how we recommend you tweak your flow and you update your flow to get the maximum utility out of the system, which is 
processing efficiency, accuracy, minimizing the amount of human machine interfaces and automating as much as possible a lot of the steps within those processes, which ultimately lead to a better result uh, for and a better customer experience. So I would recommend pulling together and getting those processes and then having that dialogue with ETI to really understand how the environment that they set up for you uh, is going to meet the needs of the organization and the and, and uh, ultimately the customers. No, that's great. That's very helpful. And I want to thank you. I know we're out of time, but I really appreciate it. It's been a, an enjoy working with you guys for the, um, for the last 12 months. Looking forward to maybe getting you back in a year's time and kind of figure out where you guys are and keep sharing and, and building that community. Um, so thank you for your time, Brennan. Oh, you're very welcome, Pete. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brandon and Pete, for uh, for sharing your journey uh, between All Points Broadband and ETI software so far. We're looking forward to some great things. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Brad Hine, and I am the channel manager for ETI software. I want to talk to you about location-based intelligence today and some of the cool tool sets that ETI is utilizing uh, today with our customers and also with other digital service providers. Um, and whether you're a traditional telecom, cable company, utility service provider, anybody looking to digitally transform can use a context of locations-based intelligence for uh, providing more context uh, to what you're doing. So let me get started real quick here. <clears throat> so more importantly today, I want to share some examples of how we are combining location intelligence with business intelligence and smart workflows through our single platform. So I want to show you some of the offerings that we have so far with our customers and some simple ways that they're quickly being able to identify, analyze, respond, and then resolve issues in a holistic way throughout their organization. So before I get started, I want to say quickly, um, my prior role at ETI, I spent a little over eight years managing our GIS and analytics plugins to our core ETI product. So the idea with that was to translate data from within a, a CRM, OSS, a BSS, or an ERP system to a dashboard, a simple location context, and give a 360 degree view of your footprint, your subscribers, services, service delivering devices and to start to phase out traditional form-based or list-based workflows that are not so efficient at times. So some of the basics here. Um, so what is it and why do we care? Location-based intelligence. So the idea is just provide a visual map-based reference. Everybody uses a map. Everyone has a phone with a map in it that I'm sure they use about every single day. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. A map interface, an interactive map is worth 10 times that. So identifying geospatial relationships with data, data patterns, the ability, ability to know where your subscribers are, where your assets are, where your workforce is, your projects, your tickets, and prioritize their place in your business is, and your operations timeline is absolutely crucial to uh, each of the service providers. Presenting data in layers. So we all know that data is grouped in certain um, categories. So um, there's a ton of data in broadband service providers that I know it currently isn't always used by the entire organization. So, but there are other industries that actually do leverage this across their timelines. So the idea of presenting this in layers just makes it easy to turn on and off as we're analyzing certain patterns as the day goes. Um, and showing this in a dashboard, this is where the intelligence really comes in. Empowering your employees to enable quick decision-making also. 
So nothing is more frustrating than if we're in a process where we have to swivel chair, where we have uh, we can't get information to do our jobs quickly. And a system like this will allow us complete visibility outside of form-based um, type software and interfaces. Prioritizing the subscriber experience. We're, like I just said, we're all very in tune with some of the things that make our jobs longer throughout the day. And the idea in all of this is to put the subscriber first, is to make sure that everything that we do is making the subscriber experience easier. So in, in time saving and everything we're gonna do here and I'm gonna talk about in a little bit with, um, with location context, we'll solve some of that. Leveraging the data in your system. So there's lots of different types of data and there's lots of different ways businesses like to analyze their data. So I'll say the main point of a platform like this, a truly open platform, like a service management platform, is there are certain manual pieces or daily processes that we have. If we share this information in a unified system, we can start to unfold some of the descriptive analysis. So current data that's in the system and historic trends will be revealed. Predictive data, so we have that data to make decisions on future events to maybe avoid um, some negative things in the future and then prescriptive also. So that data that allows us to determine now we have it all, what are, what are our options and actions moving forward? Like I mentioned, um, location-based intelligence has been around. You know the phrase location, location, location um, is a popular phrase and not just in the real estate industry, but for, um, for decades, people have been using location-based intelligence in all types of different industries. The banking institutions, the financial institutions have to track economic conditions across their footprint. They have to tie certain information to certain locations and addresses. Insurance, risk management, claims tracking, as um, inclement weather happens in other types of uh, insurance events, they have to track things in terms of location and regions, and then they have to make adjustments based on that. Large events, uh, I recently saw a study on um, a location event of, of quickly getting um, attendees in and out of football stadiums in regards to security operations, crowd flows, the density of all that uh, built into one workflow so they could work more productively. In terms of manufacturing and supply chain, I don't need to say anything other than Amazon. Amazon uses location-based context on a daily basis for every single package they ship. It's absolutely essential to everything they do. Health and human services, patient tracking, dispatching, um, ambulances and vehicles, tracking supplies across hospital territories. And we just got out of a pandemic where one of the first things that I saw as the pandemic started was tracking the incidents across the globe per state, per country of COVID events. Real estate, we, uh, we're all very in tune with things like Zillow and all of the information that it tracks. And, and thinking about this model in telecom, if you look at Zillow and you just peruse um, a lot, a residential lot, it tells you things like how many beds, bats, the price estimate or the range, a recent percentage of drop. Does it have central HVAC? Are there HOA dues? Is What's the lot size? What are the tax records? What are the purchase histories? Just an example of so much information about one property that has a location context that they share with you online. So in terms of telecommunications here, as I was saying, there's so much information that we're taking in. We're starting to see geospatial context in a lot of different applications in telecommunications right now. But let me give you a quick example of how much it's needed throughout an organization. And when, when I interview uh, different departments in an organization, so traditionally, I see map-based context used in two groups, in engineering and marketing. So these are two pretty important groups for 
um, particular ISPs and broadband. But for marketing, we have things like homes pass and demographic information, property parcels, take rates, consumption. We want to know saturation rates. We just want to know buying and selling um, patterns across the footprint. For engineering groups, it's it's essential we know street lines, center lines, feeder, distribution fiber, where that is, poles, enclosures, fiber drops, but we also have to know spatial information about how far apart they are. We need to know how to track certain circuits, circuits and, and how to do traces through those things. The, the interesting thing is that a lot of this information is trapped in these departments. It's, it's not free to utilize for the whole organization. And that's a challenge because as we move into digitally transforming these organizations to uh, to get us to be more unified and make decisions quicker, we have to release this data to other groups. So in terms of how we kind of build these data layers, I mentioned data layers before. In terms of digital transformation, we tend to think of data layers as very simple. When we look at a map, just a simple map, and we see things like streets and we see parcels. We may see um, um, elevation, land usage. We'll see customers, um, lots of different types of layers for everything. In telecommunications, it's a bit more specific. So of course, we're gonna have homes, paths, and subscribers. We have to see that, have to see that layer. We wanna see the street lines and parcels. But then we start getting into a bit more complexity. I want to see those subscribers, but I want to know all their services, and I want to know how it trends across that footprint. I want to know if they have service packages. I want to know what assets they have, what part of the network they're on. What kind of CPE do they have? Do I need to decommission some of that CPE at a later date? I want to know alerts and monitoring. So we're starting to get into other departments here. And as I kind of mention all these things, um, an example that a customer gave me recently was an engineering team needs to see all that network information so they can stay on top of the construction of the network but then as soon as that network is done a csr needs to see that information to know what parts of the network are live and active so they can make decisions on who can be customers and where the newest installs can go and as soon as that done the field crews maintaining this network and completing various tasks need to know where the other field crew folks are, where the tickets are, and when they're completed, and who's having issues. Then the NOC needs to see all this live monitoring as the alerts I just mentioned. They need to start seeing the tickets, the work orders, the service installs, the worker schedules, the billing and financial info. This is a lot of layers that represent a lot of different systems. And so my point here is, when you're utilizing a truly open and unified system, this data is a bit easier to get at. It's a bit easier to display in a very simple visual context. So let me walk through a couple of use cases that have been kind of popular for, for customers over the years and just to give you a visual context for this. So the title of the slide is, where's my stuff and what's going on? So very simply put, I just want to be able to look at a, a visual signal and context to know what's happening. I can identify layers, and here I'm identifying layers as service areas. Service areas will define where phases of the network might be deployed, which means all of those folks are connected to similar parts of the network if we have to trace things like uh, common failures or commonalities across a network. So we want to display equipment types. We know the types of equipment. Sometimes we have different vendors. We want to see where the equipment is deployed. And clustering the data is absolutely essential because if we put all of the data points on one map, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So the visual, the interface experience is absolutely essential. And so what I'm showing here is you're probably seeing is there's an alert. There's what looks like an alarm going off around where it says 27 ONTs. Now the ability to zoom in and start to see a street layer, other things are starting to be divulged now, other items on the map. So as I zoom in, I'm seeing this now, it's next to two ONTs in that area. 
And so our second use case is divulged. So I'm now I'm looking at a couple ONTs that appear to be offline or we can't connect to them right now. We we know that because on the ETI system, we're pre-integrated to the access network vendor and the management software there. So we're pulling information and showing it vis this visually over other types of data that doesn't necessarily live in that access network system. So what I wanna do now, what would be really helpful is if I can interact with that data. I need to know more. I don't just need to know there's alarm or there's a device that's down. I need to be able to drill down into that location and just retrieve some simple information before I make a decision. I can click on an ONT or any device or property on a map and get a prompt to do a couple things. Now, I see there's a, there's a certain device here at an address. I wanna open this up and just take a look at it. So here, now I'm starting to pull in, in information from the inventory system. This is a deployed piece of inventory. It shows the account that it's on. It's even showing me the product, meaning the service. It looks like it's a gig service and it's showing me a drop cable right there. So as a CSR, somebody just taking this in, it's, it's very easy to see what's going on here quickly and gather some quick information. And on top of that, I can look at some of the other attributes of the network, like the number of ports on that ONT. So I can see it's got a couple voice ports, it's got a video port, other attributions too. And importantly, I can see that very simple circuit. If you look in the bottom right corner, I can see that device is inactive currently. But if I go to the left upstream, I can see that fiber terminal SR150 is active, which is good because I know this is localized. That's an issue that's local. Down towards the node and then back to uh, the network operations center. Everything looks good so far. And once again, I'm feeding this information right through the pre-integrations that ETI already has. So what do I do now? I've interacted with it. Now, what can I do? I, I probably need to launch a ticket and let somebody know. So I have the option to create a workflow. So our use case three is launch a flow from that map, create that work order. I can go ahead and start bringing up a ticketing application right in my unified platform. I can select the ticket type, the type of device and the type of order that I need, the equipment I might need if I have to switch something out. It looks like an ONT, I'm gonna test it and maybe replace it. The time allotted, there might be some custom instructions too, like this one here says the ONT is around the back of the house. It's next to the large window. Any way to save time when somebody's on site is crucial. So it's also in a wizard driven workflow. So all I need to do is press next stage. I've filled out all of my requirements here, as you can see with some of the green checks. Now to close that work order, all I have to do is click finish. It should be scheduled. It's finished, and now I can forward it to my dispatch and get it into another system where another group can look at it, like our field management software. So it zips it right into um, an application where now the workforce team can now manage that ticket on a time schedule, and guess what? They're using a map-based tool also for all their field workers. Anyways, that's all I have for uh, you guys today. I appreciate the opportunity of being able to present this and show you some of the cool things that we have going on. Uh, moving right along, I'd uh, like to introduce you to our VP of Product Innovation, Ryan Niebel. Ryan, take it away. Thank you, Brad. Hopefully we've uh, taken up the mantle of all the things that you had been working on in the past. I, I'm I'm excited to, to just keep taking that vision forward. Um, let me Can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yep, gotcha. All right. Cool. So, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our service management platform, we partnered with Microsoft uh, about three years ago to build out a full verticalization of the Microsoft Dynamics and 
Microsoft Power Platform uh, solution set. So within each one of those um, tools that you see in the blue boxes uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen uh, with field service, we built out an infrastructure management platform, which uh, a lot of the things that Brad was just showing you um, are based on infrastructure management, being able to track the non-provisionable network elements. Um, with connected field service, we introduced the IoT pieces into the into the Dynamics 365 platform, and then Unified Device Management takes that tool set and expands it so that we can integrate into other IoT platforms, ETI's ACS platform, um, the OSS system, uh, Triad, and and an almost unlimited number of next generation provisioning technologies that will come down the pipe. It's all RESTful integration and it brings it back so that we can provide a single pane of glass for the management of devices as uh, Mr. Aston was pointing out earlier. The sales and marketing system has been extended with our own customizations around CPQ, around uh, driving the ongoing uh, sales lifecycle, driving product availability based on the other pieces of the tool set that, that have um, already been uh, provided with the infrastructure manager and the device manager, and being able to import in all of the usage data, uh, the, the calculations for third parties for, uh, for call accounting, uh, the the calculations through third parties for some of the taxes, um, all of that functionality, that's all built around the service rating engine. It's essentially invoice, billing, payment, all built out for the telecommunications industry uh, within the dynamic stack. The uh, customer service suite has been extended with the digital service provider help desk which extends the platform with SLAs, contract management tools, tying directly into that new product management and our new product cataloging system within the service rating engine. And then finally, all of this rolls into the Microsoft ERP solutions um, with Business Central and our digital service provider financials package. This tool set is intended to then be able to drive next generation uh, billing and telecommunications uh, across multiple segments of the market. So where traditionally we've been servicing the last mile service provider, we're finding that several of our newer customers are actually middle mile or open access um, service providers, inviting multiple service providers onto their network infrastructure so that um, more people are getting access uh, to that infrastructure and they're able to provide more over the top services um, and more service options for, for, the, um, for the customers that are uh, tied to that physical infrastructure. This opens up opportunities, not just for cost management, but also for wholesale billing and different ways of generating revenue from the same network infrastructure. And a lot of the things that we're investing in are about being able to find new and interesting ways for you to be able to generate revenue from the existing customer base. So if your footprint isn't changing, um, how can we help you find new and interesting ways to generate revenue around that customer base um, that you've already built the infrastructure to be able to reach. Part of this, um, it, part of these enhancements that we're continuing to work on within the tool set uh, involves better visibility into what's going on with the customers. Um, and our 360 degree um, subscriber view is part of that, um, being able to see at a glance, everything that you want to know about a customer, everything that you want to know uh, about any of the different pieces of equipment 
any of the services that the customer has taken, um, being able to then immediately jump in and change those services, change the, uh, the, the equipment or the devices, force reprovisioning, change the billing rules on the account or the pricing uh, and, and override the, 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 the pricing within the transactions, issue credits um, and take payments um, all from the account screen. So much in the same way that the Triad platform uh, and our customer uh, service platform uh, traditionally, or I'm, I'm sorry, our customer care platform had traditionally been in, um, able to provide a, a single screen to be able to manage a customer account. We're, we're just taking that further um, and giving you access to more and more information as we, as we expand what the single pane of glass is able to look at. We're also introducing a new discounting system. The new discounting system is um, going to be able to set multiple criteria throughout the um, platform. So any field on an account or a related entity to the account. So uh, is there a flag set for the customers in an RDOF service area or um, for ACP compliance, has the service location been flagged as, as being a, a tribal location? If it is, then we can drive discounting based on that functionality. Um, any criteria that you want to set um, can can be established, but the first priority is: Do you have a qualifying product? So, do you have video services or voice services or or um, internet connectivity that is that is the subject of the discounting? And that discounting system, um, as I as I just alluded to supports then um, additional discounting complexity around tracking the registration IDs and the subscriber IDs uh, for ACP, Lifeline service, um, and other, uh, other types of uh, regulatorily prescribed discounting uh, where you're going to wanna to be able to generate reporting not only on what discounts were generated, but also um, how you're rebating from those um, from those guaranteed programs, how you're going to be able to drive that. We're introducing simplified tax management um, by partnering with SureTax. Um, so the CCH SureTax um, solution is now going to be fully integrated uh, within the stack. Um, it's an optional component, obviously. You'd have to have a SureTax subscription to take advantage of it. Um, but if you do have a SureTax subscription, um, and your service footprint warrants um, the, the complexities of, of managing multi-jurisdictional taxes um, or more complex taxes around uh, the, the voice uh, services, the SureTax solution is, is there to completely offload that so that nobody has to go into the system and maintain the jurisdictions, maintain the tax schedules, um, and the tax codes within the within the platform. We're introducing omni-channel engagement uh, for several of our customers this fall. Um, this includes being able to introduce um, multi-platform uh, support or multi-portal multi support. My apologies. The the multiple portals um, are just tied to different price lists. So, and we can present those portals in a myriad of different ways through our Node.js platform. So if you've got something that you wanna surface from the system, um, we can give you the APIs, but um, we're finding that it's much, much easier to actually service you all of the widgets um, and give you a complete toolkit to simply stand up the portal as, as you guys want it to work. Um, this all is then tying into the real-time chat systems, the real-time call integrations, um, and the social media integrations that we have through the omni-channel and marketing solutions. And this then provides real-time notifications of any incoming request for communication uh, that simply pops up uh, in front of the CSRs or any of the other uh, people that might be in a in a communications uh, uh, pathway. So if um, 
we need to route calls or we need to route chat sessions to uh, one particular group of people based on information that was gathered previously, if we need to uh, provide managers the ability to see the real-time transcription, uh, or if the manager wants to inject themselves into a phone call because an alarm has uh, just been flagged based on uh, on sentiment analysis, we can now bring those tools into your call centers fully integrated into the stack. So not just phone calls that pop up the customer record, but phone and chat and social media messaging that is fully integrated with the system, the, the records of those conversations saved against the customer accounts, and an AI running in the background that's performing real-time sentiment analysis so that um, from a management perspective, you can see how well all of the calls that are currently in the queue are trending. Now, this leads into some of the extensions that we've been building around the marketing suite. We're introducing service aggregation for disqualified leads because they weren't immediately serviceable. We've built an extensive notification system for uh, from the marketing suite for bulk notifications. Well, why would we do it in the marketing suite? Why, why bulk notifications? Because we need to keep track of all the credit cards we need, and notify people when their cards are about to expire. We need to notify, you know, tens of thousands of customers every month for some of our customers that invoices are ready for payment or the payment has just been processed. Thank you very much. Um, sending out the email notifications for the um, for the invoicing. It's all now uh, completely embedded within the within our marketing suite um, as some of the first pieces that we've we've started to leverage with that tool set. Um, by using the bulk marketing tools and the bulk messaging tools, you then get to take advantage of being able to use the templating system for the for the email notifications that's all fully configurable by your teams um, and you're able to drive um, customer journey where into that process if you chose to inject marketing collateral or um, you chose to inject um, uh, offers or uh, premium subscriptions or discounts on HBO next weekend, whatever uh, you, you wanted to do to drive that subscriber journey um, and potentially um, offer them upsell within the platform, uh, that's all completely integrated with within the notification suite as well. Um, the The other piece that's being driven on the on the marketing suite is um, comprehensive data enrichment, being able to pull in data from a myriad of other sources and um, inject that into the into the customer. Um, we we've, we've built our own custom integrations for FCC uh, for for FCC data enrichment, for bringing in and automating the the management of the, the RDOF service areas, managing the, um, the, the FIPS and the census block, census track information so that nobody has to key that in or worry about that within the database anymore. Um, it's all being populated automatically to automate your FCC reporting. Um, and then within the standard marketing suite from the, that Microsoft is, is providing, you're you're going to be able to take advantage of uh, market segmentation, uh, website and email um, tracking and marketing tool sets, um, full content management libraries uh, for being able to drive those upsell activities, sh um, social selling, and even for for those of you that that occasionally have open houses or um, go out into the community with community events, there's a full event management suite um, into that uh, tool set. That messaging system that we've been building out is also going to be tying in directly into our digital twinning uh, platform. So we've spent the last two years really developing within the ISM 
the the digital twinning capability within the stack. And what we're going to be introducing next year for everybody that's interested in it are three key features that I know people have been asking for for a long time. Um, we're going to be able to track planned outage management for field service. So when a ticket is created to swap a card in an OLT or um, perform maintenance on a, on a line or uh, replace a, a, an ONT um, or some piece of equipment, uh, you know, a, a router for an MDU uh, deployment, you would be able to see automatically these are all of the customers that are going to be impacted by this field service activity and potentially then tie into that notification system to drive messaging to those folks and let them know you know tuesday three o'clock for about an hour we're going to be doing maintenance on your on your network we're sorry for any inconvenience you give people a proactive heads up um automatically be able to drive that through the system the other pieces that then that leads to is being able to drive unplanned outage notification based on our integration with the Beamfly stack. So where um, where the planned notifications are, are driven by field service scheduling, the Beamfly piece is looking at unplanned outages as the real-time alarms and alerts are coming in from the devices. And we're seeing the upstream catalyst that drove a cascade outage across um, a, a, some swath of the network. Again, we can drive automated alarms and notifications, automated creation of, of trouble tickets, um, but we can also send notifications out uh, in the form of SMS, in text messaging, in Teams messaging, and in emails to any manager any field service technician that, that might happen to be on duty, anybody that needs to be notified of what's going on, uh, we can now provide that notification system. And finally, the, 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 the ultimate piece of where we're going to be taking digital twinning is capacity management. Understanding the capacity from one point of the network to the next point of the network to the next point of the network all the way down the circuit trace to the customer to be able to determine what products can be made available to that customer based on the infrastructure that's been deployed not just what's in the premise not just looking at the at the gateway but also taking into account the card that's in the olt taking into account any switches or routers um, within the network that are part of that delivery um, for the active networks and what the absolute carrying capacity might happen to be on the wireless networks so that we can take all of those things into account and begin to filter availability of product based on the saturation of those circuits. So that, in a nutshell, is what my team has been working on for the for the last little while. Um, and there's a lot more coming. There's there's actually a ton of of new features and new functionality that's that's going to be coming in the next year. Um, if there's anything you guys want, if there's anything that you would like the system to be able to do, we we take suggestions every day of the week. So please don't hesitate, reach out, let me know what you need. Thank you very much um, for your time and for um, celebrating uh, ETI's 30th anniversary with us. Um, I'm gonna hand off now to Pete Pizzello, um, our Vice President of Marketing, and uh, he'll close it out with you. Thank you. No, that was great, Ryan. Thank you very much. And to echo uh, Ryan's sentiment, if there is anything um, we don't talk about, uh, that you're interested in, um, you know, that's what this whole thing is about is for us to find a ways to connect with you guys, um, in our community. And I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your day to be here with us today. Um, I'm going to give a special thank you, uh, to Brandon Ogilvy from all points broadband, uh, and Scott Young from SECV from sharing their insights. That's, we need to find more opportunities, uh, for us to do that for you all. Um, it is a lot. What Ryan covered was a lot. Everything throughout the day was a lot. Um, we tried to jam a lot into a few hours, um, and that was 
Um, not ideal because we're not in person, but we see it as the beginning of a conversation, right? And so we're looking forward in, in the coming weeks for us to uh, find time to be with you, be it at an event or at your office, some face-to-face -face time, just to hear about your challenges, the opportunities to, to help you dig down in some of the concepts and um, features that we talked about today and see if, how we can strengthen our partnership with you all. Um, and, and most importantly, we want to be there uh, in person to thank you, uh, to thank you for your support over these three decades. It's, it's impressive. There aren't that many 30-year-old software companies, and we're only here because of you, and we realize that. So thanks again from all of us uh, for being here today and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Sabrina for, uh, to wrap things up. Sabrina. Thank you. Guys, thank you for attending our annual uh, event. Uh, and if there are any questions at all, my contact information is, is here on the uh, presentation slide here. Call me, uh, email me. Um, we'll get you to the right person if we didn't answer all of your questions. Um, so I'd like to close with a quote by Zig Ziglar. If people like you, they'll listen to you. But if they trust you, they'll do business with you. We appreciate you doing business with us, guys. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.